It started as these things often do. With stories. There were only murmurs around town, but Habitsville is so cavernous that even the whispers have echoes. And so it wasn't long until the news reached me, Samuel Singer, Habitsville's resident investigative reporter. There's something at the bottom of Lake Laura. Have you ever heard of thalassophobia? Many people have, without even realizing it, though it's mostly used in reference to the sea. I would extend that definition a bit. Put simply, it's the fear of vastness, uh, wide open skies, the dead infinity of space, or the murky surface of a large body of water. That's why most of the citizens stay away from Lake Laura. It isn't especially huge, it's pretty charitable to call it a lake rather than a pond or a pool, but the terrifying thing about it isn't how wide it is, it's how deep. And this is why the idea that there's something below the surface is so troublesome. As far as we know, Lake Laura has no bottom. Kids do it as a dare sometimes, traveling back through the trees and cattails, diving deep into the sun-warmed water. Their friends wait on the shore, and soon the diver resurfaces, incredulous, and... There is no bottom to the lake. One group of local scientists even tied a concrete block to the end of a rope to lower it into the clouded depths until it landed. But the block just kept sinking down. And eventually, they ran out of rope. And of course, there are those stories of people going missing. A young couple frolicking out in the woods, small children lost on their way home, they're groundless rumors, mostly meant to thrill teenagers and scare the little ones. And then there was Walter Emerson. I don't remember Walter Emerson very much, mostly because he was an old man when I was very young. He had a strange pastime of trying to fish in Lake Laura, despite the fact that there wasn't a single living creature within it. Legend has it that it was on one such fishing trip that he disappeared. He and his grandson, Peter, who I had went to school with, though most believe he merely moved away. But I didn't go into the lake that afternoon because of local folk tales and urban legends. I went because odd things were rising to the surface of Lake Laura. It isn't necessarily unusual to find old things in a small town pond. It, it is, however, odd that these items belong to our townspeople. Not belonged. Belong, as in, they were things they hadn't yet lost. I heard about the phenomenon from Heather, my co-worker and friend over at the Habitsville Gazette. Yes, we patched things up since the whole, uh, finger incident. She went down to the lake to do a bit of reporting herself when she found it. A framed picture of her parents and herself as a child. It was a photo I recognized when she showed it to me because, of course, it's the same exact one that still sits on her desk at the newspaper office. Now there sits two, seemingly identical. I've done a lot more for a lot less, so, of course, I had to make my way down to the lake. There was no one else there, which wasn't unexpected. If you've read other Habitsville stories, you'd know that it would take more than duplicating items being spit out of a pond to attract a crowd. It's back amongst the trees, so I had to park my car by the forest's edge and walk the rest of the way, a seldom trotted path still beaten into the dead leaf ground. Seeing it made me shudder, though. I wasn't sure why. There was something eerie about the entire scene, and as I stood in front of it, I could tell why. It was completely and utterly silent. There were no insects buzzing by, no birds fluttering overhead, and most notably, there was nothing moving the water's surface. It was smooth and flat, like a great brownish-green disk. This was especially notable, because it was raining, lightly but enough to dampen my hair and coagulate on my lashes, and yet no ripples appeared on the surface. I watched it for a while waiting. 
And then, just as I thought I was going to have to turn back empty-handed, I saw it. I'm an old-fashioned writer. Before I go typing on my computer, I always like to handwrite out my stories and experiences. I find that my handwriting depicts that which clicking on a keyboard can't, more often than not, the slanted characters of intense fear. Despite knowing that my little red notebook was safe, laying on the passenger seat of my car outside of the trees, there it was. A dot of scarlet amongst the earthy tones. My notebook floating on an old piece of cardboard as it drifted closer. I could see that despite being in the lake and the rain overhead, the pages were dry enough to flip in the wind, and as they turned themselves I could make out my own handwriting plain as day. I came closer to the water's edge, and that thrilled me. I began to lean slightly arm outstretched, anxiously awaiting the notebook's approach. What was going to be inside? If I compared it word for word to my own notebook, would it be exactly the same? More importantly, what was going to be different? It floated closer, just out of reach, as though it was teasing me. I dug my heels into the wet silt on the lake's bank and bent even further over the surface. I let my eyes drift down just for a moment, a, a quick glance at my own reflection, captured perfectly in the glass-smooth surface of the lake. And then, a slight slip of my foot, and I had fallen in. My head was only under the surface for a second, my heart hammering in my chest. Drips of salty, stagnant water tasted unpleasant in my mouth, and I quickly pushed myself towards the shore. I had one foot on the sand, my body heavy with my water-soaked clothes, my other leg still submerged, but then... Before I stepped all the way out, I caught sight of my notebook, dancing in the water on my right. I leaned over to reach for it, my hand closing around its familiar red binding, and then... I saw it. For a moment, something large, moist, and alive wrapped around my wrist and pulled me underwater. I I don't know how long I was in Lake Laura, but it seemed an impossible length of time. The force around my wrist refused to let up, even when I thrashed and beat against it with my other hand. It pulled me deeper and deeper, the pressure on my head growing more uncomfortable. The lack of oxygen was painful, and when I opened my eyes, black dots danced before them, interrupting the dark brown view from within the lake. My ability to fight eventually left me, my limbs feeling fuzzy and far away, and as the gears of my mind ceased to turn, one simple fact remained in my brain's hollowed center. I was gonna die. And then my head broke the surface. I was gasping for breath, my lungs aching and raw. The thing that had coiled around my arm had slacked. I scrambled out of the lake and a a rush of adrenaline and relief flooded me, and I coughed out more and more lake water. The notebook I'd almost died for was gone. Must have let it go when I was fighting for consciousness, which meant that the only thing I was leaving Lake Laurel with was my near-death experience. And at that point, I had no interest in the stories. I just wanted to go home. I made my way back out until the tree line broke and I was quite literally out of the woods. I was incredibly tired of the fatigue of almost drowning, unlike anything I'd ever felt before. But there was a problem. My car was gone. It had stopped raining, which was good. It wasn't a long walk back to town, but like I said, I was tired. My lungs were so damaged from the water that I couldn't stop coughing, so I I was out of breath the entire journey. So by the time I reached the cobblestone streets of Habitsville, I didn't have the strength to really pay attention to my surroundings until I saw something I couldn't ignore. I just turned onto the main street of Habitsville, lined with the usual shops and boutiques, but despite the hour, they all seemed to be closed. The lights off, the doors shut. But this isn't what I noticed. There, in the center of Main Street, was the longest table I'd ever seen. It stretched down the length of the street, and it was decorated elegantly, like a Thanksgiving photo shoot for one of the home decor magazines that my mom loved to read. There was even a large ice sculpture of a swan on one end, and a cornucopia of autumn fruits and squashes spilling out on the other end. Seated in chairs on either side of the table was everyone I knew. Heather was there, 
eating ravenously, a napkin tucked around her collar. Phil, the mailman, was there, doing much of the same. Grease and sinew dripping onto his chin, making his skin shine in the setting sun. Derek, Mr. Chatter, Luke, Nora Vandervelt, the mother and kids from the planetarium, they, there was someone else there too. Someone I couldn't place at first, but as I watched their teeth tear into flesh, their eyes vacant with hunger, I recognized them. Much older Peter Emerson. They were all there. They were scarfing down the meal that had been laid out for them. The meal which, upon closer examination, made bile rise to my throat, and my skin prickle with horror and dread. There, browned from being flame-broiled, teeth hidden between burned lips clamped firmly onto an apple, was a body. A, a human body. My human body. My face was a dried husk, and somebody had poked out one of my eyes with a fork, but still, I knew it was me. I could hear the clack of my bones as they tore my individual ribs from their cage, mouths sucking the meat and fat from the cartilage. The little planetarium girl took my other eye, biting into it with a splatter like a cherry tomato. Those eating from my stomach dipped their knives into the coagulated fat and spread it like jelly over the bread. Every stab and prod of a fork making me cringe with phantom pains. Everyone was eating with such gusto there was no time for talking other than grunts of appreciation over their feast. That's why everyone heard it when I coughed. I couldn't help it. The last bit of lake water working its way out of my lungs. The moment I made a sound, the chewing and tearing of flesh stopped. The citizens of Habitsville ceased eating and all collectively turned to face me. They stared at me, and I stared back. They turned towards the collection of my bones that was piling up on the tablecloth and the body that was slowly being robbed of its meat, and they all turned back to me as though gazing at the tender food that still remained of my skeleton. Then dozens of tongues licked dozens of lips. I was already running when they got out of the table, the clattering of dishes rattling against the wood enough to motivate my legs to move faster than I ever thought they could. I was tired, so incredibly tired, and yet I couldn't stop. There was only one destination that made any sense to me, and yet at the very same time made very little sense at all. When I approached the forest's edge, I stole a glance back and I could see them moving together like an angry mob, bibs flapping in the wind, utensils raised to grab what they could. All of my friends and neighbors were sprinting towards me with eyes of gluttony. I dove into the trees, bram scraping against my skin, watching carefully for the tree roots and struggling more and more to lift my sandbag legs. I could hear the chorus of heavy breathing behind me, the branches breaking as they tore like a freight train through the wilderness and towards their prey. And then, then I was back at Lake Laura. Despite everything, I, I hesitated at the water's edge. That thing that had grabbed a hold of my wrist and almost drowned me was still in there. I, I was sure of it, but, but then I thought of the small girl biting into my eyeball. I shuddered. I, I took a running leap, and just as I heard the crowd break through the trees and into the opening, I was underwater. I swam down as hard as I could, and though it was impossible to see through the murk, I could tell by the strange silence around me that none of the crowd had followed me into Lake Laura. I propelled myself deeper and deeper, far deeper than I would have ordinarily been comfortable with, but drowning at the bottom of the lake would have been better than the alternative. I was losing strength quickly, and as my movement slowed and my mind grew blurred around the edges, I felt it. The smooth surface of something warm and alive treading itself, this time around my ankle. It hesitated for a moment, and the fear in my heart momentarily brought me back towards lucidity. I kicked once in fear, and that was all it took. It began to pull. It dragged me hard and fast through the water, down further and further, the liquid pushing so hard against me that it quickly filled my nostrils and my chest. Flitting thoughts of death danced around me once more, and then... It happened again. My head broke the surface, and sputtering, I pulled myself to shore. Cool rain hit my already soaked skin as I coughed back up the lake water, my nose and chest burning. It would be, it would be a long time before I'd be able to get that taste out of my mouth. I looked for any sign of cannibalistic mobs to burst through the trees, but there was nothing. And so I made my way back to the forest, and there it was. My car. My sweet... Merciful car waiting for me by the tree's edge. I rode back to town, and as I drove down Main Street, I could see it. The shops all open as they were meant to be, no long table filling the streets. 
my fellow Habitsville citizens milling about and enjoying their afternoon. I longed to be in their shoes, blissfully unaware of the, the taste of the water of Lake Laura, unknowing of what lies deep, deep below the surface. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode, this October fest on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, that my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Champinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>